All of this PAX East 2016 coverage is brought to you by Cyber Power, who make the fan book that we recently overclocked past four gigahertz. So there's, as I understand it, a server wipe coming. Correct, in fact, we're, we're, we, we, we do them periodically once a quarter. Uh, so there's actually one happening you know, right now, the immediate moment there's a wipe. But the one that's happening right now is the second to last. Uh, the one that's gonna happen at the end of July is the last one. And so after the end of July, uh, when this final wipe happens, that means from that day forward, your character and your possessions and your homes and uh, everything about them will evolve persistently forever. Right. Now, that still doesn't mean the game's done. In fact, we, we don't think the terms, the old terms of alpha and beta and launch necessarily mean much to us because in some ways that's the launch, right? The, the reality it begins that moment. Right. But we're not releasing the full episode one story until close to the end of the year, probably uh, December. Um, and, and then, of course, then the features aren't, you know, we're going to be adding features forever and release new content forever. So we're not going to have a time. There's not going to be a moment where we go, the game's done. Congratulations. Let's drink some champagne and, you know, uh, we're finished. Start working on the next one. Start working on the next one. one. <laughs> uh, we, we just don't perceive that ever happening anymore. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point with the industry right now where I, I don't know how much of this can be attributed to the Kickstarter backer model versus how much is just the industry evolving, but it seems like a lot of games now have, uh, take as an example Dota or Counter-Strike, they start with a lower population, they grow over time. I don't think that used to always be the case, it seemed. Like yeah, well, what's interesting is, um, you know, look at, uh, I think the best example is EVE Online. Right. So EVE, when it came out, it, you know, was not an instant success. And now it's one of the biggest, you know, online games out there. And so that, I think, is the, the best model of how to take the kernel of something that's fun and has a core market and improve it over time, bring in more people over time, uh, and, uh, and grow it into a, a mega property. Right. And, you know, one of, the, one of the tragedies of a lot of the big publishers these days is... They, they, they're, they feel like, you know, I have to come out of the ga gate and beat WoW. And the only way to do that is to overinvest what WoW has spent basically in their lifetime to beat, to beat all the art and all the features and all the content they've created. And so they'll go spend, you know, half a billion or a billion dollars on a big, you know, MMO. And then guess what? It doesn't beat the World of Warcraft because it's basically a reskinned World of Warcraft. Right. And you know players you know uh, aren't going to switch for that, uh, and so they give up on MMOs. They just say like, well, this is way too expensive, way too risky, takes way MMOs too long. Are MMOs are dead. I'm out. <laughs> and uh, and of course, it is true that they were on the wrong strategy. Um, but but if you try to do like you know what we experienced with Tabula Rasa with NCSoft, NCSoft's first game was a mega hit, uh, and and uh, their lineage game in Korea was bigger than WoW and bigger than you know, EverQuest and bigger than all the stuff in the US. And so Tabula Rasa, which launched modestly in the United States, but still profitably in the United States, we were very happy going like, all right, we've got our, we've got our foot in the door. Let's start building and right. we'll start stealing uh, you know, market from everybody else. And NCSoft was already like, oh, that's, you know, compare, compared to lineage in Korea, it's already a knit. So they, were, they didn't have the patience or interest to, right. uh, to try to see one grow. And, um, uh, and so big publishers, I think, will struggle with MMOs. And so that's why I'm excited not about what we're doing, but I actually think that, you know, you look at what uh, Brad McQuaid's doing, Mark Jacobs doing, Chris Roberts is doing, um, Warren will be doing, McQuaid, Pantheon. Right. Uh, you know, uh, uh, these are all people who know how to make good games. They know how to do really good gameplay. I'm excited about all of those. Uh, I'm confident they will, uh, you know, be strong contenders, right. but they will start modestly with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, some or all of them, I believe, will get the opportunity to grow into millions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That does seem like the the new model, especially for MMOs. With Shroud of the Avatar, what's your? Who do you see as your core market? Who's the core player? <clears throat> well, the uh, you know, so so I'm lucky enough to have had you know 30 years of of creating games called Ultima that have its own core market, and so uh, that really is my core market is the people who have have experienced my earlier work. Now that being said, uh, the the challenge for me and our team is to make a game that is accessible enough to bring in youngsters who frankly are too young to have experienced a lot of our earlier work. You know, I have a, 
I have, the, I, have the, I have posters of all the games we've ever made uh, on the wall, and near it I have post-it notes with the birth dates of all my employees. <laughs> and uh, about a third of my employees were born before I published my first game of Calabeth. <laughs> but another third of them weren't born until like after Ultima 6. Right. You know, and so I'm going like, these are it's a, a bunch of them even until after Ultima Online. And so it's like, okay, I, I, you have to really completely reset your expectations to go, there's, you know, the majority of gamers could not have experienced all that. Right. And so the risk for us is to make the game so deep or, and which can be interpreted as so complicated that uh, people don't get a chance to really, especially people who are accustomed to playing first person shooters or these very uh, visual rich, but uh, uh, simple from uh, ways you can interact with the world. Mechanical standpoint. Mechanical standpoint. Yeah. Simple games. How can you really take this newest generation into the deeper gaming? Which has happened for every generation. So that's solved. That's been solved in the past. Right. Uh, but that's probably our biggest challenge is because I, I like to make very deep experiences, very diverse experiences. But it means you have to handhold people into them in a way that they're both find compelling fun early and are not overwhelmed with the complexity. Right, and then that plays into sort of the consequence recovery reward system as well, where uh, especially if you look at the newer MMOs, personally I played EverQuest, where if you die, you have to do a corpse run. Mm -hmm. And that was a big deal. And the, the sort of death penalty for games has... Has lightened. Lightened considerably. How do you, how do you look at, how do you uh, work with that for Shroud of the Avatar. Well, we, we, uh, you do have to go get resurrected uh, in ours. It's not as bad as the old EverQuest corpse runs, but right. we actually are a little bit more, uh, you know, you turn into a ghost and you have to go find a, a resurrection onk and then you become re uh, corporeal again. Right. Uh, and, uh, but it's rel it's re it's, it exists, but it's fairly light. But, uh, but, and we think that for the beginning character, it sort of needs to be that light. Sure. But we're toying with, you know, as you be, the more advanced a character you become, and especially the more kind of PvP oriented you become, you really want those penalties to be high. Yeah, and I, I think it actually makes the, you know, at that point you're an experienced player, you know the game mechanics, you're not gonna be thrown by it, uh, and that, that risk reward, the risk part of the risk reward, uh, is something you embrace, uh, because it makes you more scared. Especially in PvP. And so, uh, so yeah, so we're, we're looking at cranking up the death penalties, uh, and even for episode two, we're thinking of cranking them. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I mean, this is so far just talk. This is not, right, right. this is not a decision. <laughs> uh, but you know, part of you know something that I'm at least machinating on is the, uh, you know, should there be permadeath at some in at, at some cases? Is that a consequence that we should allow people to uh, engage? Right, that would be interesting, even as an opt-in or something. Yeah. So uh, in our case, there's a there's a there's a plot reason uh, why uh, that might turn out to be important. Got it. <laughs> so we will leave that for you yeah. to discover. Yeah.